Uh, Lori joined us, uh, Shell, in 2010 uh, after 24 years with uh, ExxonMobil and about 18 months with Hess. Uh, she's, I have to tell you, one of the things Lori's brought to, the, to, to Shell is this, uh, this sense of running a business which I think we all, uh, we all really appreciate. I mean, most of us in the manufacturing world have spent most of our life trying to worry about the kit, and, and Laurie has brought in this refreshed view of running it like a business, so, so we really do appreciate that view. Uh, Laurie uh, joined as a regional vice president in Europe and Africa, where she was overseeing five of our facilities and five joint ventures. Uh, and then in 2013, last year in about October, she, she became the executive vice president. Laurie is, is known now within Shell for her deep technical knowledge and her passion for manufacturing, something I really appreciate, and she brings that energy to, to all of her dealings with us. And, and one of the things I have to say finally is uh, Laurie is a really good friend of Deer Park, and we think of her as one of our honorary family members. So I want to welcome Laurie Ryerkirk. Well, thank you. It is such an opportunity to be here today. I have to say, I have lived and worked um, all over the world, but it's always really nice to be back in Texas. Um, you've heard a lot today, and I know we're at the end of the day, but I wanted to take the chance now to have just a bit of a discussion about what's going on in our industry, because we need to be having this discussion in our world, not just in Shell, not just in the Gulf Coast, where we are at the heart of the oil and gas business, but more broadly across the world and across all the industries. Because the future is energy, and energy plays a critical role in the development of global economies worldwide. And the role we play as refining and petrochemicals is really, really key. You'll notice that I use the word business, and you heard Barry just refer, refer to it. I have a passion for business. There was a time not very long ago when all of us running refineries and chemical plants just ran the kit. You know, we were supposed to keep it safe, we were supposed to keep it reliable, but somewhere off in the vast morass of the corporate culture, somebody else was supposed to be worrying about making money. That just doesn't work anymore. Our world has gotten very complex. Um, it's very interconnected. The global economy is generally weak, and as a result, we have pretty challenging margin environments in most parts of the world. And I want to take just a brief look at that landscape. Let's see if we can get there. There we go. Okay, so in North America, we have been very fortunate. We've seen the development of light tide oil over the past several years. Everybody's mentioned that. And of course, we've also seen the exponential growth in natural gas production, largely based on the introduction of technology, horizontal drilling and hydraulic fracturing, or fracking as everybody likes to call it. And so that's really allowed us to access cheap oil and gas in previously inaccessible formations. What we see, of course, from that is a real boom in investment for refineries, for petrochemical plants, and for logistics, whether it be rail, or waterways, or pipelines. This has been a boom in North America. Unfortunately, this has not happened in the rest of the world. The healthy margin environments we enjoy here just don't exist in other places. In Europe, we continue to experience declining product demand as people drive less and we replace fuels with other types, along with a persistent overhang of refining capacity driven by government policies and a desire to retain jobs. In Asia Pacific, we witnessed a huge growth in refining capacity over the last five to 10 years, which unfortunately hasn't been matched by a growth in product demand. Although there is some growth in product demand, it's not enough to take up that capacity. And all of that growth is supported really by governments and again, a desire for in-country jobs, in-country capacity, and a way to avoid reliance on imports. And of course, the more refining capacity we've seen in Asia Pacific, the more pressure on the US export markets and specifically on the Europe export markets. So given these worldwide margin realities, those of us who work in this business have to ask a very fundamental question, which given the high risk and low returns of our business, why in the world would we want to be in the refining and petrochemical business? At Shell, our answer to that is in our, starts in our belief that there is value in being an integrated energy company. Certain parts of our portfolio, so for example, gas to liquids, could not be developed and could not exist if we didn't fully understand and have competency in both the upstream and the downstream part of the business. The other answer to that is evident right here in North America. 
Prior to 2010, refinery profits, good or bad, really moved around the globe all at the same time. They were all very similar across all the regions of the world. Just prior to 2010, we saw profits in the East starting to decline because of the, because of the huge amount of growth. And then in 2010, we saw a big shift in industry when the North American refineries began to enjoy um, an increase in profits relative to the rest of the world. Just one year later, by 2011, the U.S. had become a net exporter of products to the rest of the world for the first time since World War II. And just last year, in 2013, so just a few years later, we were seeing American refineries making significantly more money than their European counterparts. And I'm going to give you a number. In 2013, U.S. refineries, North American refineries made $7 a barrel on average. European refineries lost 50 cents a barrel. That is how big the disconnect has grown in the world because of cheap natural gas and advantage crudes in North America. And I think even more interestingly, if we look forward by 2016, just two years away, it is predicted that the entire U.S. crude demand will be met entirely by U.S. domestic production, with just a little bit coming from our nearest neighbors in Canada and Mexico. And so it's no wonder that last year Bloomberg published an analysis of the refinery prospects for 2014 and they ran the story with the headline that said, the U.S. crude oil refinery to the world. That is what we've become in the U.S. So what's behind the opportunity and how do we make the most of it? So I mentioned this is really based on technology. It's based on hydraulic fracturing. It's based on horizontal dr um, drilling. It's the shell revolution. And it's really capturing all the new reserves of tight gas, shell gas, and coal bed methane, really helping the U.S. to build its economy and become more competitive. And I think we see that throughout the industry. Access to tight oil has increased U.S. production from over 5 million barrels in 2008 to more than 7.5 million barrels in 2013. That is the largest five-year increase in crude production in American history. That's how revolutionary this is for the U.S. Analysis with Deloitte and Touche have called this energy revolution in North America wholly unthinkable just a few years ago. And I think we can all agree with that. There was no com company out there, and I've been with several of them, there was no company out there 10 years ago who foresaw anything like we had predicted anything like we've seen in the gas and the shell bed revolution. On top of this, of course, North American refineries and the chemical plants are reaping the benefits of cheap natural gas. Um, for example, natural gas in the U.S. is 50 to 75 percent cheaper than natural gas anywhere else in the world, with the exception of the Middle East. That's a huge advantage for our manufacturers. It helps us purchase natural gas and ethane and back out having to move propane and butane, which are more valuable products, into our fuel system. It makes for cheaper hydrogen, and of course it makes for very cheap feedstocks for our petrochemical industries that are now thriving in the U.S. So, let's move on and talk about logistics. With this increase for supply and demand in the U.S., there's been a huge increase in the need for logistics as well. And we started to see this change in late 2012 and into 2013 with the pipelines that were commissioned to move Eagle Ford and Permian Crude into the Gulf Coast. And in 2014, we're seeing another wave of pipelines being built to carry the Bakken, the Niobrara, the Canadian Heavy, and other light volumes. And you've seen even things like Shell's own HOHO, Homa to Houston pipeline reversal, which allows crude to flow from Houston to Louisiana and is helping to equalize the pricing, reconnect the pricing between the LTO grades and the Mars and light Louisiana crudes. We can only expect that there will be even more expansion and more build over the next many, many years. So that's a view of North America, and I actually want to focus even closer to home here in the Gulf Coast. In May of this year, the New Orleans Times-Picayune ran the headline, Gulf Coast Refineries, Refinery Profits Rise on Cheaper Oil Pipeline Upgrades. And the story basically noted that refineries along the Gulf Coast were particularly profitable, due in part to pipeline expansions that increased the flow of crude to the area. There are great opportunities in the Gulf Coast. Over 40% of the U.S. industry's total petroleum refinery capacity sits right here. 
and 30 percent of the total natural gas processing plant capacity sits right here in the Gulf Coast. And the transportation infrastructure, of which you just heard about from the panel, in the Gulf Coast makes this region even more attractive. We have pipelines, we have waterways, we have terminals, and we have rail refiners all connected here so that we have a variety of choices about the mode of transportation in order to meet the demand. It's no coincidence that Shell has two very large refineries here in the Gulf Coast. And Motiva Port Arthur is, in fact, the largest refinery in the country at the moment. We know others will try to catch up. And here in Deer Park, I think we have a great facility that really is a microcosm of the approach that we are using on our refining journey in Shell. Deer Park goes back to 1929, and it's grown over the years to become a fully integrated refinery and petrochemical plant with 1,600 employees and about the same amount of contractors spanning a 1,500-acre site right here on the Houston Ship Channel. And I got the chance last night to see it from the water, which was a great experience, I have to say. The site refines 340,000 barrels a day of crude, produces base chemicals and other raw material chemicals, and is a major integrated pet petrochemical hub. That is the future of our industry. And like many refineries in North America, Deer Park has continued to grow, even at a time we see a lot of shut down, refinery shutdowns and scale downs in the rest of the world. In fact, within Shell, while we've had growth in Deer Park and Port Arthur and many of our North American plants, in fact, our worldwide refining capacity has been reduced by almost one third since 2002, reflecting the very difficult margin environments around the world. So why do we operate a site like Deer Park? I think it's really simple. We're in the Gulf Coast because we think this is a region of the world where we can win. So let me share an example. Deer Park is actively optimizing its assets, including its stocks, its tankage, to ensure the flexibility to process all of the advantage crudes that are now available in North America. If you look at LTO, light tide oil production, it has grown significantly, as you can see, over the last five years. And that is pushing out crude imports and really lightening the crude slate. So what we need is, so despite the growth in heavy Canadian crude, which you hear about, you see the gravity is still increasing for U.S. refinery feed. So our manufacturing facilities here in North America had to become more flexible to take advantage of light tide oil, as did others. And Deer Park answered that challenge by coming up with inexpensive, because we're a business, and innovative ways to increase the amount of LTO that could be processed in their crude distiller. And that facility can now process a significant amount of LTO as part of their crude diet, when it makes economic sense. And we're exploring other options to further increase this capacity into the future. The other advantage that you enjoy here in the U.S. is the complexity of the refinery assets. The U.S. is significantly more complex than any other group or region of refinery assets in the world. And there's no reason to believe that this advantage will not continue into the foreseeable future. So having that greater complexity in the form of conversion and hydro treating capacity allows us to run a crude diet that is a higher proportion of discounted heavy crudes, higher sulfur crudes, and to efficiently, efficiently convert these into products. So actually, regardless of LTO growth, and regardless of whatever happens around the crude export ban, the U.S. refineries will always retain this complexity advantage into the future, as well as the transportation advantage of being so close to the source of many LTOs and so close to Canada. The last shift I just want to mention is the shift to, from gasoline to diesel. We see this happening globally, a bit slower in the U.S., but it is happening here. This demand, the demand for gasoline is declining because of the introduction of ethanol, improvements in vehicle efficiency, and of course the introduction of the CAFE standards that push people more towards distillates. And again, U.S. refineries have responded with a focus on improving distillate yields and an investment change in investing in hydrocrackers as compared to catalytic crackers, which has happened in the past. I want to shift and just briefly talk about petrochemical demand. If you look at petrochemicals, this industry is seeing consistently high growth around the globe, especially in polymers and basic chemicals, which I think you have the second and third lines on here, almost at the rate of GDP growth, and certainly higher than the growth, although it's been great, but the growth that we've seen in natural gas and oil. The demand growth itself is actually mostly in Asia, and that's, of course, 
fueled by the per capita consumption increases driven by the increasing personal wealth in Asia and the population growth in Asia. And despite continuing commoditization, there are still a lot of ways within the petrochemical sector to create value. The use of advantage feedstocks, for example, and of course, the introduction of more competitive technologies. And the margin environment we make in petrochemicals suggests that this is a good business to be in. Manufacturers are still gonna to have to work smarter and faster and while still holding on to our core values around safety and operational excellence. But if we do that, we could be highly competitive here in the US and here in the Gulf Coast. There is a tremendous opportunity in petrochemicals. Once again, let me point to Deer Park, um, which is an integrated refinery and chemical site that is able to leverage a large variety of products, technical, and personnel resources. We have really strong leadership at the site and they're building a dynamic culture where our employees and our contractors can run a safe, reliable, and flexible kit with another essential piece, a true understanding of the part that they play in making the site profitable. Because at the end of the day, we are a business. And I think the site takes pride, and I take pride in them, in the fact that they're making a very positive contribution to the economy of this very supportive community that they work and live in. So personally, I'm very excited about the prospects for refining and the petrochemicals globally, but specifically here in the Gulf Coast. And I want to thank all of you who are represented here today for the part you play in growing and supporting this really important and vital part of our economy. Thank you.